Hi, Bill Hensaw here again for the Constitutional Crisis Channel. Another interesting, albeit quote-unquote arcane subject that you sure as hell never heard about in school, and neither did I, but this is one that's going to beat them, is uh, presidential elections, fact or fiction. Those of you who have followed my earlier videos are going to know the answer without me having to tell you. For those of you who are just starting out, uh, it's plain fiction because there are no presidential elections. There are a lot of reasons for that. The best one, and the one that we want to harp on here, if, if I have to do it, comes uh, because if you read your Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, says that the electors, uh, the state legislatures, have the right to appoint the electors and every constitutional authority virtually across the board, if they don't agree on anything else, agrees with this one, that this power rests with the state legislatures. The problem with that is my research analysis and now my record, and I've got a dead bang black and white, has established there are no states. If there aren't any, how, pray tell, do we have state legislatures able to appoint electors, and how do we then have electors able to elect a president? Oh, oh, oh hello. Um, this is the kind of issue. We get this before them. And by the way, I've checked my references. There's not a single case on this in any of the legal research I've found. There are some cases under 212, but nothing raising an issue of this type, and there damn well should have been. Because if we do this and we take it into court, we're going to beat them. And dead bang. Because they're sitting there without any authority at all. So this is really good news. And this comes up, um, and again, it complements my state versus territory issue beautifully. Those of you that have listened to earlier videos, you know where I'm coming from. Because you find out in territories, you know, if you do your research, and I have, I'll put a, a case law citation for you in the notes out of Puerto Rico, where the 11th Circuit, which is where they are, uh, dead bang decided that you had no right to vote for president in a territory. That makes perfect sense to me, given the situation that we're now in with no states. We have only territories, there's no right to vote for president. Hence, from their point of view, at 120 Broadway, New York, New York, no harm, no foul. Another thing comes up here with regard to United States Senators. There hasn't in the entire 225-year history of the nation and republic been a senator from a republic, from a, a territory. Doesn't happen. They're not permitted to be represented there. The House of Representatives, yeah, they've had them. And territories, as far as my research shows, are entitled to one representative non-voting. Under these circumstances, can you tell me where in the hell they get a quorum to do business in either House of Congress? I haven't figured that one out yet. But that's a real problem because any laws they quote-unquote enact, there's no one there to that has the proper credentials to have passed it, even if they could. And most of what they enact these days is so far outside the Constitution, you can't stand it. But this puts us on really good ground across the board here. And it just, I mean, what it sets up is incredible. It just knocks them all out. And this is true of your state offices, too, because they're territories, and yet Congress doesn't have any power to relegate states to territories. I sure as hell haven't found anything like that. They have the power to admit new states, but not to unadmit them. It's so simple when you think about it, and you look at it through this prism of state versus territory. Now, in this regard, I have a little bar bet for you. Next time you're sitting at the bar, and the guy down next door from you is sitting there drinking a beer... Ask him if he knows who the last president of the United States was. Now, there's more than one right answer here. Uh, I have a bit of personal bias and prejudice here, I admit it. But to me, it would, would be our 17th president, Andrew Johnson. Because he was the last president in office before the enactment, quote-unquote, of the 14th War Amendment. And that, with that enactment and the change in the electorate that we had, even if we would have state legislatures, we would have had the wrong electorate to be voting in the first place. Those that owed their citizenship to the 14th War Amendment, and therefore the government owned them. It doesn't own me, it probably doesn't own you either. But for my money, Andrew Johnson, uh, you can go a bit further back and argue uh, that James J. Buchanan, uh, elected in 1856, Reason for that being that the election of 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was quote unquote elected, it was a plurality uh, election only. He received 42% of the popular vote. It was the three 
three people running against him. John Bell was one, and they had another one from the South. And Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in the South, and John Bell wasn't on the ballot in the North. But he got most of the electoral votes, but you can argue that Lincoln wasn't properly elected, and if that's true, that would, alas, take Andrew Johnson out of the picture. Um, but that said, uh, anybody that you ask that question to in a bar that answers without hesitation, Andrew Johnson, you give them my information here. We have a lot to talk about, and I want to talk to them that would know this and know the reason why. I mean, they're the sharp end of the stick here. So that said, this type issue, when they see this coming, what's going to happen is you put in paperwork and you challenge this stuff properly early on, they're all going to be mortified, and they should be, because what it means is what they're trying to do to you in a traffic court or a criminal court, quote-unquote, whatever, they can't do because there's no jurisdiction. And with no jurisdiction, what do they not have? Official immunity. This is not this civil rights BS that you see across the board all the time. That's not what we're doing here. You're saying common law action, trespass via armis by force of arms. That's the common law action. Assumption is another one that may work here too. But you're saying that you're coming at us with force of arms, subjecting us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws. That's true whether it happens to be admiralty and maritime. And think about this one a minute, people, because the Supreme Court has ruled that the admiralty jurisdiction is closely associated with Congress's Commerce Clause powers, interstate commerce. If there are no states, upon what political entities does this power apply to? I mean, that's a hell of a problem. If it's federal regional martial law rule, which is kind of what I'm inclined to think that it is, well, number one, there's no known state of declared state of rebellion or invasion where they could suspend the writ of habeas corpus or do anything else along that line. And number two, if there was, it would only be a temporary condition. They can't otherwise do it. Now, this case, and I've referred to it before in my earlier videos, it's Ex Parte Milligan, M-I-L-L-I-G-A-N, 71 U.S. 2. That's one of the ten cases that you should know is Milligan. Read it closely. You can Google this one online. It'll pop right up. And you read this, and you read all of it. And you'll see what they were talking about and what they were doing there. Well, they can't use this one either because there's no known state of rebellion or invasion. States of emergency, quote-unquote, don't count. I don't care what kind of emergency they have, but Hurricane Katrina, this, that, and the other, that's only good for temporary locations and places and for a very limited amount of time. They can't just declare a state of emergency from coast to coast. Although the New York banks just seem to think they can do that all the time. That's exactly what the hell they're doing. And a quick aside about that, if you look at... Uh, Title 12 U.S.C. 95A, and you see in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 that the president is authorized to declare a state of emergency without any apparent limitation on these powers. It was delegated to him by the Congress. Well, backing up to what we're saying about the elections being fraudulent, if neither Congress was in session or the president hadn't been elected, how the hell are they doing this? That, and that beats the federal, I mean, can you imagine we're going to go out there and beat the federal reserve system? I mean, that's exactly where we're headed. And it's going to be tough, it's going to be hard fought, but I've got most of the groundwork done now, and in our adversarial system, we need one common law court to get this issue across, either to the nine old farts in Washington, or a common law jury. So hopefully you want to go on the journey with me here, and, you know, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to send them to me at my email, uh, ckaspari at live.com. That's C-C-A-S-P-A-R-I at L-I-V-E dot com. I'll be glad to get back to you. Thank you.